Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Lineup with Dave Prodan. I'm Dave Prodan, and this is episode 10. Now, my voice sounds a little scratchy at the moment, but fortunately, it wasn't when I had the conversation with our guests, so you just have to suffer through it for this first part. But there is a lot happening in the world of surfing, despite it claiming to be a quote-unquote off-season. Shun Murakami and Brisa Hennessy took out the Corona Open China last weekend and now have the honor of leading the 2020 QS rankings. Logan Dulian's snap crew in Benji Brand and Seth Moniz are in Central America scoring freakish labs for the forthcoming Snap 4. If you haven't experienced the previous three installments, do yourself a favor and check them out. You won't regret it. And word from the man himself is that Snapped 1 and Snap 2 are going to be online for the first time next week. So we're all lucky because of that. And finally, the WSL, where it's been reported that I work, has a new CEO with Eric Logan succeeding Sophie Goldschmidt this week. We'll see if we can seduce Mr. Logan to get on the podcast in the future where we will shame him into giving us more lefts on tour and a permanent event at Duranbaugh. Finally, thank you to everyone who's been donating and supporting the emergency responders and families in need in Australia. We received a lot of notes after last week's episode, and the people affected by these fires are going to need support to rebuild their lives well after these fires disappear from the news headlines. It's been awesome to see how everyone in the surfing world has stepped up to help. All right, episode 10. In the Northern Hemisphere, particularly here in California, it's been cold. I don't know if I'm getting older, but I have checked with other aging, self-professed nonconformists, and we collectively agree that it's not us, but it's just been a particularly cold winter in California. And that, for me, brings to mind the classic California winter spots. When I was growing up, I vividly remember reading a surfing magazine article penned by Evan Slater about Mavericks describing ice cream headaches and multi-wave hold downs and duck diving next to great white sharks, and I was absolutely terrified. Flash forward to 1995's Beyond Monster Mavericks film, where I'm first introduced to today's guest taking mind-blowing beatings out at Mavericks, laughing, going back out, and just completely transcending the already pioneering field of big wave hellmen at not only Mavericks, but Piahi and Puerto Escondido and beyond. Pre-social media, the dimensionalization of what these guys did in civilian-sized waves didn't really connect. So I was legitimately stunned when I first encountered this quote-unquote big wave icon in the flesh grinding away at the 2006 San Miguel two-star at Ensenada and just blitzing the almost non-existent waves running down the point. The waves were so small that event, we actually canceled it before we finished. Versatility, reinvention, and a constant shattering of expectations. Our guest today has proven himself as one of the most impressive surfers in all conditions ever to set foot on a board. He's won not only Central California's most prestigious event, the Coldwater Classic in 1997, but also the 2013 Mavericks Challenge. He's a longtime Eddie invitee, and he claimed the Big Wave World title in 2012. At the height of his powers, he battled with substance abuse, and he candidly shared his journey with the surfing world. Today, most people are now exposed to him as the spectacled, aloha shirt wearing, charming, fount of information on the WSL broadcasts, a real surfing Mr. Rogers. Few people, however, know about his certifiably insane, badass credentials. And that's what we hope to tap into a little bit here. Please enjoy the lineup's conversation with Santa Cruz icon, Peter Mel. The good old clap, take one. That's right. <laughs> How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? You can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once, let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. Let's talk to your boxes. <laughs> okay, Peter Mel. I was trying to think of an interesting avenue for this conversation because we're going to talk about a lot of things. But I was thinking of the juxtaposition of how gnarly your life has been across your five decades of existence. And what most people, how most people are exposed to you, which is on the WSL broadcast, and that is this is a super nice, hyper intelligent, analytical, sort of Hawaiian shirt wearing Mr. Rogers guy. But in truth, you're like this badass Lord of Winter. <laughs> 
today when people come up and talk to you, like what is their experience of you and what is their impression? It's exactly that. Um, you know, it is, I mean, the WSL has exposed me more than ever I would have imagined through, you know, professional surfing. I mean, this is, you know, it, it, people send me every day, they're sending me ways to explain weather, you know, uh, asking me about my Aloha shirts and what brands they are. Uh, it, it, it's the truth. I mean, and, and everybody does genuinely feel like they know me because of our experience on the, on the WSL and the broadcast. So it, it's a lot of, a lot more, and, and it's a variety of people from young kids, um, boys and girls to old men. It's a full broad spectrum. And it's interesting to see who is watching the broadcast because I do get a spectrum of of who's there watching. So it's been um, enlightening, I guess. But I also kind of have fallen into that quote unquote role as Professor Pete. And, you know, and, and then it makes me want to get better at being that guy who can tell you facts and give you information you've never learned before. Do you think that role and how you express yourself um, through that role. Do you think there's a huge delta between that and who you really are back at home? Yeah, I do. Because I now have to watch my P's and Q's. I, I you know, occasionally I get angry. Um, I get, you know, in the surf, you know, you, there's this way I was brought up as a young man in high school and, and then into surfing with all of my peers in Santa Cruz, you know, and this group had a very, you know, diverse and very huge impact during that era that we were, uh, my professional surfing career. And that is a lot different than what I am in the broadcast. Now, don't say that I'm not saying that I'm just not putting on an act because mm. that's not the truth. I am very interested in weather. I'm very interested in the way the rules and regulations work in the WSL. It's something that's important to me. That's why I took the role of commissioner at, of the Big Wave Tour at one point. So I do have those interests and they're there. But yeah, I, I mean, I almost feel like I was more acting <laughs> when I was a, a professional surfer at that time with the group I'm in, you know, and you're, you're trying to find yourself. And after five decades, you know, I'm still searching for you know, my true being. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it's almost like um, I think of it as like, you know, finding out that your home ec teacher is actually like a hell's angel biker in, in real life, you know, because you do throughout your role right now have to be approachable and inclusive and accessible. But as you as you touched on before, where you came from and your development and really for you know three to four decades of your career, like it was an aggressive Hellman kind of lifestyle. It was. I it guess. still is maybe it, you know, it, in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways it is. It's a way to express myself and, and express who I am as a surfer. You know, I like waves that, that charge me up. And I've always liked that. And occasionally you do need to, you know, in order to do that, you have to have a, a tiny screw loose and be able to accept well, what we're doing could, you know, send me to the grave. So, you, you know, I'm not being, you know, on the broadcast, I'm not in that danger. And not always, not always. Right. <laughs> I, actually, I guess I could take that back <clears throat> depending on what water they send me out in <laughs> you know, so, during the broadcast. Sometimes pots can be pretty mean, too. So, Oh, uh, yeah. And Strider. And, you know, we're but we're all so that's what's so neat, I guess, is that I was realizing this last night when we were going to have this conversation. I was thinking about the people I'm hanging out with right now and how long I've known them. Strider, for example, uh, Ross Williams, uh, Shane Dorian, uh, Kaipo. I met all of these people when I was 14 years old and I came to the U.S. championships in Makaha in 1984. So I've known these people for 40 years and that's pretty cool to be able to be hanging out with people. And I think that's where surfing has given me that and to, you know, go through. I mean, yeah, I didn't hang out with them every day for many times of the year, but I do now and I still have this really close relationship. That's kind of it. I mean, I, it's, you know, we talk a lot about like extended families and like it is a, there's a bond and like a common language shared, you know, when you meet people through surfing, you know, and you, you might not keep in touch for years and years, but you know, when you do reconnect, it's, it's, it's easy going because you've had those shared experiences. When you mentioned coming here at 14 for the U S championships at Makaha, I think that was your first experience with big waves on the North Shore. Is that right? It, it was. It was at Sunset Beach. I came over with Mark Gowen, um, Adam Replogo, who is my best man and godfather to my son, John, uh, Mark Machado, Will Church, right? And these are all guys that were Santa Cruz legends at the time and still are. But they brought me under their wing at 14 and brought me here. And they, you know, I had three surfboards at the time. I think that was my quiver, right? I was a 6'10", a, a, you know, a shortboard and actually two shortboards. But yeah, that was my first true experience of the exhilaration that I had, because I'm going out to a place that was obviously scary, you know, at that age. Mm. 
And I remember riding a wave I had a borrowed seven six from Mark Gowen and kicking out of a wave after, you know, I caught it, you know, it probably was only a four foot wave, but it sure felt big for me at the time. And that exhilaration that I carried in the fact that there was Mark Gowen in the channel, like, you know, cheering me on about this, you know, amazing wave, that feeling I've been chasing for 40 years since, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's still vivid in my memory. In Northern California, Central California, where you're from, Santa Cruz, it has sizable waves as well. And we'll get to, to Mavericks, which has been you know a huge pillar of your life for a long time. Before you came here for the U.S. championships, did you find yourself already kind of maxing out your spots in Santa Cruz in terms of size? Like, I'm just curious about where that appetite for something bigger came from and if you knew it was inside you before you kind of tasted it at Sunset Beach. I don't think so, no. I mean, I... You know, I had a group of friends that I surfed with, and, and I grew up in the south of town, right? So when you're young, you know, it, your expansion of Santa Cruz is now just this little dot in the world. But in, at that point, it was huge, right? So I was from the beaches, which was in, you know, southern part of the county. And I had a group of friends that I surfed with out there at Manresa State Beach and those little beach breaks down south of town. And I didn't, you know, Pleasure Point was also a stomping ground because of the fact that I started surfing in that area. But the west side was a whole different can of worms, right? So... In my small little world, I mean, I in my peer group, I, I did like to think that I was the guy who wanted to catch the bigger waves, but I don't think it was something that I knew was something that I was going to excel at or had a joy for yet until there was, I mean, because Sunset Beach is a is much bigger than um, anything we had in Santa Cruz at the time. There is big waves there, but I hadn't gotten out of my little bubble to really experience that yet. And I mean, Santa Cruz is such, it's sort of a sacred mecca in surfing in a lot of ways. Um, it has a strong surfing culture. It, it has really proud people and proud surfers that come from there. And for good reason, the Mel family in and of itself is is Santa Cruz surfing royalty in a lot of ways. And, and your father and Freeline Design Surf Shop, can you tell us about growing up and your family and that genesis growing up within surfing? Well, my dad was a surfer. So my grandfather actually was in the Navy and he came here in, in Hawaii and actually surfed in Waikiki with the Beach Boys. So he did actually, we can call him a surfer. I don't think he actually caught the bug, but he had surfed, um, you know, that was in the early 60s, actually probably even earlier. But my dad was a surfer and, and really ended up following that <laughs> solely. You know, my mom was just tagging along with him and they came to Hawaii. Uh, my dad wanted to start a surfboard business, and he had been learning to shape under Gordon and Smith in San Diego. He had a shop in San Diego at one point, but then decided, hey, let's let's go to Hawaii. They ended up getting pregnant in 69 that uh, they were living out in Mokalaya. So I was actually conceived here. But at that time, business wasn't going great you know, for my dad. There was a lot of shapers in town. And my mom was selling Avon, uh, and Avon wasn't selling real great over there on <laughs> the Mokalaya side. So uh, they decided to get up and, and move to Santa Cruz. And they had traveled up there on road trips. And so they, they fell in love with it. And they got a house and ended up starting the business, which really was out of one door. It was our retail shop. It was our home. Uh, my dad made surfboards out of the garage and in the back and actually a lot of times in the house <laughs> at times. So I really did grow up in a surf culture and solely um, that's all I knew. It took a little while to get me into the water because my dad had made a mistake of taking me out one day at, at Sewer Peak, which is in Pleasure Point, and scaring the lights out of me. And I, I didn't want to surf with them. And that was about probably nine or 10 years old. So it took me a while to get back in. My mom was a beach uh, bunny at the time now because they'd started the surf shop. So she would go down to Capitola, which is a really great spot to learn. And that's where I kind of cut my teeth and started surfing like every day. There are, I, I mean, I've got, um, you know, six-year-old twins, so they'll be, they'll be six soon. And um, I, we live in Ventura. And I do think there are significant barriers of entry just with the cold water and the waves compared to, you know, we know families that are in, you know, Orange County or Hawaii or Australia where it's like, oh, it's so nice and warm and there's little waves. But, you know, there are areas where it is a challenge, like it's cold and you can get thumped and you can have a bad experience when you're young. And I do think there's something in that, even though the barriers to entry are higher, the people that develop develop there and the people that make it have a, a layer of toughness, you know, like, oh, we used to say that about people that had to become pro level surfers, had to wear a lot of wetsuit, you know, thick wetsuits. It's a little bit like um, being in the batter's box with a weight or a donut on the bat and swinging that before you take it off to swing in the batter's box. And it's kind of like that, you know, it's a bit of a resistance training, but I think also kind of mentally too, for a lot of people. I would agree. 
but it all, you know, that toughness actually in the long run does end up helping you, you know, cause when you do get to shed the wetsuit and, and you know, you're dealing with kelp, you're dealing with cold water, you're dealing with sharks, all of that in Santa Cruz. So there's a, a bit, yeah, to jump in the water, it, it can be quite scary, especially for a young man. So, or a young boy. And, uh, I think that it does end up benefiting, uh, you know, considering that you, you have to overcome all of those things before you, you know, become a great surfer. So you, you essentially grew up breathing in the foam dust being, you know, having that in your, in your blood in a lot of ways. And when, when did you feel like you caught the bug for surfing? Um, if it wasn't in those first experiences, it was definitely the summer times with my mom, um, around 11, 12 years old in Capitola. She would, uh, you know, go down with her good friend and, and hang out at the Capitola wharf. And I would jet down to first jetty, second jetty, which was actually a really neat place to grow up as a surfer because it is a, it's secluded, it's covered with kelp. Um, there's food down there. There was 25 cent tortilla chips that you could get um, all day long. And I could just hang down there and it was safe enough that my mom, you know, let me down there at 12, 13 years old. There was a great group of surfers that I grew up with. Matter of fact, Tony Roberts, who ended up being a major influence in my life later, but in the early years, he was the best surfer in the area. And I would just watch him and what he would ride. And, and I kind of, uh, you know, from bodyboard to, you know, to ended up, I did have a surfboard, but I ended up bodyboarding first and then took to a surfboard. And then that Capitola was the place, you know, and as you get older and want to get bigger waves, you just moved up the point. Um, our surf shop was there at 41st Avenue, which was right at Pleasure Point. I used to run all O'Neill's, um, the corporate office was up there and a lot of friends worked up there and I'd run, you know, so I kind of ruled the roost in that area at that time. And that was, you know, I could skate to surf and the hook was a good part of my life too. So it was one of those places that you literally just had an environment that allowed us to, to surf every day. It, you know, it was with the cold water classic when I started 14 years ago, it was always like a favorite stop on tour. It was always sort of in autumn. It was in October. And Santa Cruz always felt like this interesting, almost kind of biosphere in that part of the, the coast, in that the coast is obviously exposed to a lot of weather in a lot of waves. But every time we'd be there, it would be really nice weather, like nice waves. And like it felt like a really healthy community in a lot of ways to develop into a surfer. When when you were coming up in the, I guess it would be late 70s, 80s at this time, can you kind of describe what Santa Cruz was like? Was there any burgeoning east side, west side kind of rivalry? And, and what was that like? There definitely was. It, it wasn't as, it used to be a bit more of a true rivalry, almost in a way, again, because there was, the, you wouldn't be allowed to surf. If you were from the east side, you'd surf the east side only, solely. You wouldn't travel over to the west side. Uh, the west side was the same thing. They come over to the east side, um, it would be fights and, you know, they would be yelling and you can't come here and very protective of your environment. And that was kind of the atmosphere that we grew up in. It was a protected, you know, you protected, there was a, a hierarchy, you, you respected your elders. And if you didn't, you got dunked, uh, you got sent in, um, you know, these things where it was, it was scary, right? And was that, was that, you said it was a gang mentality? Was it exclusively around surfing? Was there other elements to it? Um, or was solely it solely surfing? That's an, I mean, <laughs> It was. It was solely surfing and surf spots and the protection of the surf spots. I mean, on the west side, you've got Steamer Lane, which was the main mecca for west side surfing. Then you'd, you know, kind of head in. The river mouth would be pretty much the border, which was uh, right there by the boardwalk. Demilitarized zone. Exactly. You know, and, and occasionally that wave would get very, very good. And uh, that would be a place that there would be this confrontation. You know, nowadays it's even further segregated. There's the Midtown who protects the river mouth and the harbor. <laughs> and then Pleasure Point being the mecca of, of the east side, Sewer Peak, the Hook, all of those. And those were the two quality waves that were consistent. You know, we, we could surf 360 days of the year in those areas. Um, and so, yeah, it was... It was a thing that was solely about surfing and protections of the spot and, and the hierarchy that came with that. Now, in my era, the violence and, and so forth wasn't there anymore. Uh, you know, it was, it was you know, occasionally if you, you know, had a problem with somebody because they dropped in, but ultimately you were sharing surf spots. But there was this, you know, healthy heckling of, you know, if you're a West Sider, you're an East Sider. And we actually had an event that we used to call the, the Yeah Now No Cord Classic, which was sponsored by O'Neill. And it was a done where we would have an East Side, West Side team kind of uh, mentality going. And I believe there was even, an, uh, you know, if, if the West Siders came to Pleasure Point and they won the event, it was this big thing, you know, and uh, it wasn't, again, violent at that point. It was more just about clout. Mm. Echo echoes of the the generation before it yes yeah, absolutely and so development wise i mean i think the thing that is another thing where where people kind of 
maybe when they ex get exposed to you now, they're like, he's this analyst for the WSL. I know he's got a big wave pedigree, but the reality is, is that you and a number of guys that were in your generation are incredibly well-rounded aerialists, like contest surfers, like power surfers. When you're developing in your teens, like what is that? What was the motivation for you? Was it just fun? Was there was there a professional aspiration? What what was that like for Peter Mill? Well, it was it was a peer group, and we were always about one upping each other. Um, and that as a group, generally, that's what will allow that group to rise. Hmm. Um, we had a great amount of um, surfers. You know, I mean, I I can't even name them all, but you know, I had aspirations of you know Richard Schmidt and Vince Collier being two guys that have gotten out of our little Santa Cruz bubble and made this international. You know, there was the year that. Thruster was introduced, um, and Simon Anderson, Vince Collier, and Richard Schmidt showed up at that day at Bell's Beach, which is a legendary day at Bell's. And to be honest, Vince Collier went into that event and and blew minds. And he was riding a twin fin, and it was a, a little teeny twin fin that he just shredded, and everybody couldn't believe um, how well he had surfed in this guy from Santa Cruz. And that had rumbled through Santa Cruz. That was a, a story that we all heard from our elders. That, like, here's Vince Collier, this god who and Rich, who who surfed internationally and made this uh, impact and, and put Santa Cruz on the map. It, it's amazing, I, just pausing for a second, thinking about how information travels today versus then, you oh, know, yeah. um, and, and you being almost a fulcrum for that experience and that everything is live, right? You know, social media is you know, live this, live that, live webcast, but back in the day, you know, Vince Collier, uh, Vince Collier making a huge impact at Bell's Beach. And then news of that traveling back to Santa Cruz is, you know, via a phone call yeah, or via- Coconut wireless. <laughs> and and, and it, it's in a lot of ways, like the myth building around that and the legend status is like heightened. It is. In a lot of ways, especially because Santa Cruz feels like a really tight knit community. So having one of their own go make a mark on the international stage is a, is a huge deal. It was a huge deal. Um, and again, it's the elders telling you this. And this is something that, like, you know, as we were a bit of a tribe, and the way that we told those stories was through, you know, sitting there having the coffee in the morning at your local break, talking about these stories and these legendary stories as you're watching Vince Collier tear the lip off of, uh, you know, a wave at the Seamer Lane in the slot. So that it still has that, I guess. Um, a, a little bit, but yeah, you're right. I mean, now social media, you don't have, you can, you don't have to leave your couch and you're going to hear these stories. It's true. I mean, I think surfing more than a lot of other things, like really cherishes like an oral history in a lot of ways. You know, I think you're right. Like, I think like everything across the spectrum of sport and entertainment is like, um, hyper covered in a lot of ways. But yeah, I do think there's a lot of like, you know, sitting in a bar, having a beer or sitting in a parking lot, having a cup of coffee and discussing like real life like heroics in a, in a lot of ways and i can imagine that's like hugely formative to kids growing up in the 80s and 90s yeah and and, and just to to get back to the group that i cruised with you know we we were a group and we we were very hard on each other you know in, in regards to you know we gave people a lot of shit you know and we gave each other a lot of shit and that was something that you know no one no one could rise above individually uh, you know, if you started getting a little bit inflated in your ego and anything, you'd be brought right back down, whether it be by uh, you getting yourself stripped naked and thrown off the cliff, <laughs> you know, if you're being a little bit lippy to, uh, uh, you know, to just literally, you know, public embarrassment by your peers. It was pretty, pretty gnarly in that sense. But I, I, I feel like what that did was to lift us as a group. You know, maybe we didn't rise as quickly, but ultimately I think that uh, as, you know, we we were always trying to, who did the biggest air of the day, who who caught the biggest wave of the day. And, you know, that you could kind of get a little inch above your peers slightly, but as soon as you started to get a little bit further up, they just rip you right back down. That, that de development in kind of extreme and sometimes negative circumstances is kind of consistent across a lot of spaces in surfing. You know, in Australia, they got tall poppy syndrome. It's It's very similar. Um, you know, thinking back to like the Kauai boys with Bruce and Andy and, and Borg when they were developing, it is a lot of, I, and I suppose there's probably a lot of sort of male friendship psychology that goes into it. You're competing and you're aggressive and yeah, it's, it's maybe not the best in terms of balance or like holistic development, but <laughs> you know, it is something that's not unique to really any group or any sport. Like you see it consistently and uh, for better or worse, it does push people. It does. Yeah. And you know, I, but I do see areas, especially nowadays that where they're lifting each other, right. Um, doing everything. And it's, it's similar in the sense that it's a, there's a, as going as a group. I mean, I, I take San Clemente for a prime example. You know, you've got a guy like Kolohe Andino who has 
really put himself with the younger group in that in that town and, and become a bit of a mentor and a peer, uh, even though he's got a couple of years on a Griffin Colapinto mm-hmm. or a Cade Matson, for example. You know, these guys are being lifted positively mm-hmm. rather than giving someone shit to push them down. Or, you know, the Gadowskis brothers, exactly. the, the positive vibe warriors probably aren't stripping any kids naked and chucking them off no, the pier. No, uh, absolutely not. And, 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 and to be honest, I believe that... Uh, <laughs> The, the group mentality that the San Clemente guys have, have brought is something that we can all emulate. I think that these days we have to be supporting each other. And I've seen the, the progression that comes out of San Clemente as an example of that positive affirmation and that positive vibrations. Yeah. So back to your development, you know, pushing with your group of peers and, and maybe not having any specific goals of I'm going to be a professional surfer, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. But it's really just sort of teenage years, I'm competing against these guys. I just want to do a bigger turn or a bigger air or, or catch a better wave or get a better barrel than that guy. Yeah. And and when we were, we were at kind of the era when this is where I, I bring up Tony Roberts again, he was one of the guys that was a filmmaker. He turned into a filmmaker and he, and a, and a photographer, uh, he was a very well-rounded um, in both of those aspects. And he developed, we would go as a group and shoot anywhere we could. Uh, whether it be still photography or creating our parts, you know, and, and ultimately that's what we did is that we were part of that VHS era. It was really, <laughs> there was only a few people doing it at the time. And we made several films together that really kind of kickstarted my career. My competitively, I never did exceptional. You know, I, I was able to make a few heats here and there. I, I, you know, I ended up in, you know, 97 winning the Coldwater, which was actually the Clarion Billabong Pro at the time, but it was at the lane. So it was, you know, labeled the Coldwater, right. no matter what. Uh, any event at the lane is called the Coldwater. This is professional. So, you know, my competitive, you know, as far as that goes, I would never was a you know, top 16 surfer. I aspired that mm. to be there, but never quite got there. What were, you know, looking back, what were some of your strengths and maybe what were some of your weaknesses as a competitive surfer at the time? I think that I just never was truly talented in small ways, being a bit gangly, um, being that you're a I, bigger guy, like how, I big, how big are you? Yeah, I'm six two. Away, you know, at that time I was about you know anywhere from 150 to 175. And now you're like now I'm 76. No, <laughs> I'm 200 plus. <laughs> we'll call it. I try to get the goal of 200 pounds, but I'm around 210. So I am a bigger guy, and I always had been a bigger guy. But I excelled. Obviously, my my. Uh, was that, that I like bigger waves and I mm. surfed bigger waves good, well. Um, that was something that I had loved to do and I and I feel like I excelled at and it was exciting for me. So I, I did end up coming to Hawaii and doing well in Hawaii. Uh, I would come and do the Triple Crown and I would make a few heats there. Again, never, never winning here, but I did you know, from a Santa Cruz guy coming to the North Shore, I was able to gain respect by catching, you know, good waves and big waves. You know, I surfed YMAF for my sur- first time when I was, um, it was the one where I probably just had turned 16. So my birthday's in November. So we come here during the Triple Crown, which is in November, December. And, you know, I, I, I remember that was actually the year after I came for the 84. So I've been coming since 84, pretty much every season. And uh, that was the first time I actually had one of my own nine foot surfboards. I, I came here and I surfed YMA and I did it with success. Matter of fact, I had uh, Johnny Boy Gomes send me in <laughs> that first uh, first uh, day at YMA. Send you in? Why? Because you were too successful. He, uh, we, we shared two waves together. <laughs> And I happened to be a little bit deeper and he wasn't exactly excited about the fact that I had, you know, ridden to, here's this kid riding a little bit deeper than him. Sure. And, and Johnny wasn't, you know, what are you, what are you thinking? You know, and I, and I was probably, I, and now looking back, I mean, I was probably a little bit uppity, you know, I'm, right. I was getting excited and <laughs> I, like, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, don't die. Like, yeah. get to the oh, I'm, and I'm trying to go deeper <laughs> and, you know, and sure enough, I got myself into trouble and it was a perfect excuse to go in after I'd already ridden about four waves. So I, <laughs> good learning experience. Yeah. yeah. And, and I've had that relationship with Johnny. Um, you know, I, Literally just ran into him the night before last. He was there at, uh, in Jaws. He was there supporting Makua Rakai Rothman. And and seeing Johnny now, it's like we are really good friends. And we've gone through since that day of my first meeting with him where he sent me in to um, – there's been through a couple ups and downs. Um, you know, Pete Dabby was a, a good friend of Johnny Boy Gomes who passed away at, in Monterey. He was another guy who came to the North Shore and was a huge impact on the North Shore. He's part of the Hui. Yep. Um, and here he is from Santa Cruz coming here to Hawaii and accepted by – the Hawaiian and, and we had a great relationship there and you know there was another <laughs> moment that Johnny and I got some some uh, a confrontation that we have been able to get over but again 40 years of surfing and and Johnny Boy being somebody that I looked up to my entire life and and being able to give him a genuine hug and and love him you know just yesterday sure uh, I mean it's sort of the trench warfare friendships you know like you don't always get on in the moment but after 
you know, a, a while, like the bonds are still pretty tight. They, they're, they're even tighter. Yeah. I, I believe when you get you're able to go through all the cycles of a, an emotion and then, yeah, you are definitely tight. The, um, your win at the cold water, you know, that, that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. It is, it's such a major badge of honor. It seems like in Santa Cruz, it's almost like they're pipe masters. It, in, for in sure. It's hundred percent. It is. I mean, and, and we'd love to have that event back at some point. We we've still kept it alive. We have a, you know, O'Neill sponsors a, a, a Halloween event that is kind of the cold water. You know, um, we, we invite, you know, other people out of town. Cause I think that, you know, we want it to be an international event, but that's, it has been an international event. So to win it, you get that badge of honor. Th those those always felt like some of the most special years because it became such an important stop on the qualifying series, sort of in the mid to late oddies, I think, when I was like, going up there, because it was the last like major point opportunity before the Triple Crown. And so you get a good international field of surfers that had a good chance of qualifying for the CT. And then you get a number of locals that were also, some of them were traveling internationally doing the QS, but a lot of them that weren't. And anytime one of the locals would do a run through the, the event and get to the final win was like, it felt like the like Super Bowl party. It, it, and it is, and a lot of the reasons why is because Steamer Lane isn't an easy wave to surf. No. You know, there's a lot of guys who would connect with it. I think that one surfer that I remember connecting with it was Martin Potter, but another one was Jordy Smith. Mm -hmm. You know, he came there and was able to connect. And to be looking about another great surfer, the greatest of all time, Kelly Slater, hates the place, mm -hmm. has never, ever connected with it and never, you know, in his mind will. You know, he, he's like, yeah, you guys can have it. I don't want Steamer Lane. So uh, it's funny like that. And I think that that's something that made that event special is because it wasn't a place that you just automatically connected with similar to pipeline. I mean, I think there's people that come here and connect with pipeline right out of the gates and there's other that don't want anything to do with it. It's funny how like the strongest surfing communities often rally around like really like idiosyncratic waves, like really unique waves. Like you think like Bell's beach is actually a really interesting and tricky wave but you have one of the strongest kind of surfing communities around it. Same with Santa Cruz, you know, I, it's a little chicken and egg. I wonder if it develops sort of different kind of characters in a lot of ways, but I think that's right. Like it's almost extra special when you see someone, whether they're local or not connect with the spot because it has challenged people like Kelly in the past. Yeah, no, it totally does. Um, and I love that Kelly kind of has been very vocal about the fact that he hasn't connected with it and, and is not something that he's very fond of because that makes it that much more alluring, right? It's like, here's the greatest of all time who says he can't, you know, really connect with a wave that he's supposed to be able to connect with anything because he's the greatest. He he loves to focus on like, um, failures isn't really the right word, but you know, like um, <laughs> sort of varying degrees of perfection in a lot of ways. So maybe if we, if we, if we hammer him a bit on the steamer lane thing, you'll probably buy a house up there and yeah, just, right. until he can get it right. <laughs> well, I mean, this example being, you know, I, I'm surprised he doesn't have a house on Sunset Point yet. You know, <laughs> he's got a, he's got a house here at Pipeline. We That's, know he serves Pipeline well, but Sunset, you know, those are those things that we all, you know, and as a commentator, like as an analyst, you know, we, I loved that Kelly was in the event and I wanted him to do well. I wanted him to conquer it. And the fact that he didn't just like, man, I hope we get another chance to see him surfing there again. I, I kind of, you know, you don't want to play psychologist. I kind of think we will because it feels like as in this era of his career, he's looking at like rounding out those edges and, and polishing sort of his legacy in a lot of ways. I'm sure he would anywhere that he hasn't quite nailed it. I'm sure he's like, I, I will get that wave, you know? Yeah. And I, and I think he did that at Mavericks, you know, there's a place that he came um, that I know that, and I think a lot of the reason why Kelly hasn't really necessarily connected with up there in Santa Cruz is the cold water. You know, he's not a fan of cold water. You know, he's wearing gloves at Santa Barbara. I don't think you have to wear gloves at Santa Barbara and he does, right? So he's not, he's affected by the cold. Um, and he, and again, he's explained that in his years, but he went to, to Mavericks and he, he made an impact. I mean, he ended up getting a runner up there. There was a iffy if semifinal with Jay Moriarty uh, during that year, but Flea was able to beat him. And that, uh, you know, obviously ironed his legacy by beating Kelly Slater at Mavericks uh, in, during uh, his prime. Let's talk about Mavericks. Tell me about the first time you heard about it and then tell me about your first time there. Again, Vince Collier comes into uh, my mind. Also a Schmidt, but not Richard Schmidt. It was actually David Schmidt and Tom Powers. Um, these are three surfers from Santa Cruz who went up to Ocean Beach to go um, surf Ocean Beach, which is north of Mavericks. It's a big beach break right there. That's a great, you know, barrel and uh, one of the most amazing world-class beach breaks in the region. But it was too big there. Uh, and Jeff Clark had met in the parking lot with him and said, hey, I've got this wave you got to check out. And so, I mean, the story is, is is in the movie, you know, the movie that we have, Chasing Mavericks. It's a story that's very well known, but that's how I heard about it. Because literally, 
I think it was that day that they had surfed it. We were at Steamer Lane and we were, we're surfing Middle Peak, you know, Middle Peak's gigantic and we're you know trying to ride some big waves there. And, and Dave Schmidt comes into the parking lot and he's like, you've got to go check this wave out. And he basically brought that to my knowledge at that time. And, and how, then- How old are you then? Uh, I would have been 20. It was like 91, 90. So you've got a few Hawaiian seasons under your belt. Oh, you're, yeah. you're feeling in, in your bones that you you have a thing for big waves. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I, I'd surfed Waimea after that many times um, and had you know success and try, you know, and then this is where my bubble grew, right? But in Santa Cruz, all of a sudden you go south or north, there's world-class waves there that are very challenging. And so I had gotten out to experience those waves. You know, we we have some stuff up north that's just in between Santa Cruz and Mavericks that are high quality waves that are very challenging. Mm. So I was always cut my teeth doing that. Um, you know, and again coming to Hawaii, surfing Sunset Beach, and and having success there and loving it. So it was a perfect time for Mavericks to kind of come into my life. Um, I didn't have. 10 foot surfboards at the time. You know, we didn't need 10 foot surfboards. Even the biggest boards we were riding at the lane and so forth around eight foot, you know, and, and eight twos were something I brought to Sunset Beach. Nowadays, they don't even ride those size boards, but uh, you know, so I'd never had a 10 foot surfboard. And all of a sudden it was like, Vince was like, he was making these 10 foot surfboards and he'd made a bunch of them. Um, so my first experience going up there was on a borrowed board that I borrowed from Josh Loya. That was a, a Vince Collier board. and. You know, I went up there and again, caught our first waves and that was in 91, 90 or 91 that winter. And it, it, it was a, there was only a few of us who were doing it. Um, the Santa Cruz guys at that time were my peer group, which was, you know, the, the warm outs. Um, you know, I had the Acker brothers, uh, the Loya, Skinny, Flea, Adam, you know, Roof. We all went as a group and we'd go up there and it was during our, you know, peak of our quote unquote careers at the time, maybe mid twenties. And this wave was very special. It was, it was by far gnarlier than, you know, I don't want to say too loud, but gnarlier than Waimea um, for what it was because of the fact that you've got cold water, you've got this, it was a slab, you know, here's this 20 foot slab that just was, it was crazy. And so uh, it, it, it came at a great time in our lives and it was a, it really actually kickstarted my career even further because at 25, all of a sudden I was kind of known, Flea and I were known as the guys up there that would you know, catch the biggest waves. And, and we did it as any time we could because it was such a thrill. And I mean, that is such an impressive peer group. I mean, they've been chronicled in magazine articles and videos like Beyond Monster Mavericks, et cetera, et cetera. But you and Dale Verosco, Flea, really separated yourselves from that group you know, Flea, I think, was known for these hair-raising kind of drops and, and you in particular for toying with the bowl in a way that no one else was doing at the time. What was your relationship like with Flea from a friendship standpoint or maybe not? And also just from pushing each other as surfers. No, we were we were good friends, mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, that all started with our group shooting and and surfing together every day. Yeah, um, and then that just translated to going on up there. But it was the same competitiveness that we had. You know, who's doing the biggest air, who's doing the biggest turn, to who is catching the biggest wave and getting the most deep, and and actually ended up who's winning events. You know, sure. and, and Flea really separated himself by winning three Mavericks titles back to back to back. And I never getting that opportunity. So it, it drove me to keep wanting to try and, and compete and win at Mavericks. And in a way, like I felt like I wanted something to prove. So I was always chasing flea, <laughs> you know, and, and either day, there was days that I would get um, the best and biggest waves, you know, and that felt great. But I think that at the time, you know, we were solely thinking about surfing and these days it's totally different, you know, about what gets my juices flowing, you know, but at that time it was, it was about, you know, fame and, and glory and <laughs> which is kind of a sad thing, but that's at the time, that's what it was. Well, and I don't think that's unique to surfers. I mean, I think most people in their twenties, that is like either a explicit or implicit kind of driver. I think in surfing in particular, like it's something that continues to come up in conversation, but because we love it so much, because we'd be doing it even when we weren't getting paid, it becomes very hard to say no, mm. whether it's to a contest or to chasing a wave or to anything. And it becomes a singular focus in a lot of ways. And it feels like, you know, at that time, specifically looking at the surfing industry and the trajectory of your career, there is a conflation of components, whether it's money being infused into big wave surfing and your profile rising and just generally being one of the better rounded surfers on the planet that can lead to a like, challenging time for anyone in their 20s. Yeah, I, and it, it was, you know, I mean, because it, it led to a path that, I mean, we went up to each other, not only in the water, but we would, you know, partying and, and doing everything. And that's, you know, it's stuff that 
I can take as an experience and learn from and, mm-hmm. and grown from it. And Flea has too. I mean, um, you know, our, our stories are chronicled through throughout the years and it's not something I like to totally revisit, but the reality is, is that it's made me into the man I am today. And, I'm, and again, I'm still learning always, uh, even at 50 years old. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think it's, it's interesting. It is one of those things where, you know, I, I remember reading a report about brain chemistry between similarities between how the brain activates with adrenaline between kind of extreme action sports and and substance abuse yep. in a lot of ways and there's a there's a high um it's called addiction <laughs> yeah well well that's right right yeah. um and and it, it kind of leads to like a high um percentage of you know bipolar disorder and and i think serving in particular you end up it's it's high and low right yeah. you're on a wave feeling amazing or you're just sitting there yeah. or you get to go surfing or you have to kind of get back to everyday life and these these wild swings kind of emotionally and psychologically i, I do think drive people into that space a lot of times or they at least sort of encourage it and i think obviously at the time the industry being what it was and the culture being what it was is you know, substance abuse was was something that was there. Yeah, and it was involved in the culture too, right? It was yeah. accepted in the culture at the time, especially. So, you know, it was our group was involved in it, and we all, all you know, and I in in our town, which and I think every town as a whole has that kind of dark uh, area of of um, community. But in Santa Cruz, there's think thankful is that there has been this learning curve for our community, the surf community, to see you know the destruction that it's caused to a few of us. And, and to see a lot of us persevere as well, um, in, including, you know, Ruth Lee, myself, and um, there's a lot of other surfers too. But now you can look at this younger generation and ultimately as our job <laughs> of a, a community is to be able to instill these values in these young kids now that are, you know, and they're coming up and they're understanding that um, you don't have to go that road uh, to be successful and, or even to one-up your buddy, you know. So it, it's pretty neat to see that kind of happening, um, at least in our town. Yeah, and I think that almost speaks to kind of what we were talking about before of a, I don't know how you, how you describe it, but like a communal change in how you support one another or you support the next generation, you know? And I think, again, that's not unique to Santa Cruz. That's not unique to surfing. I think that's just kind of across the board. Very true. But yeah, I mean, do you do you remember a specific moment that was maybe the bottom for you that you decided I, I need to change? Yeah, it was about my family. You know, my, my wife uh, who supported me um, and still does to to this day, you know, the birth of my child, it, you know, was supposed to be able to help that, but I still was able to um, try and balance it all. Mm-hmm. Um, the You know, there was a moment though that I was, I was hurting my wife um, and hurting someone that I care about so much uh, in a bad way that, that it, it shook me up. And also, you know, my ego, right, which was, everyone's going to find me out. <laughs> so yeah. there was a, a point there where I'm just like, Hey, this is, um, I need to do something about this. And, um, luckily I was able to find, um, some, some people and find things that helped me get through it. And, and this was mid oddies, right. Yep. That, that you, uh, you became sober mm-hmm. and from a career trajectory for you at what are you thinking at that point in terms of how you're going to keep pursuing things? Was it helpful in terms of focusing in on pursuing big waves? Was it I'm going to diversify and learn different things about maybe you know business management or get into <laughs> broadcasts? Like I'm curious, and I, and again, I I think it this is something I think everyone's curious about for all professional athletes when they're saying, okay, I'm no longer whatever I'm competing at the highest of high levels. Now I'm going to look for the next step in my life. I was very fortunate that at the time I was with a company, Quicksilver, and it was it was interesting because my career I got into my sponsorship started with Quicksilver in the late twenties of myself. I started when I was twenty six or twenty seven is when I actually got with Quicksilver, which at that time was kind of the twilight of a professional surfing career. It, it, you know, I, I was going around looking for sponsors at the time because I was with World Jungle. Remember World Jungle is uh, you know a brand that was. Um, developed in Southern California, but they were kind of closing up their doors. You know, it wasn't, it was shutting down. Jack had, Jack Denny, who was the owner of the company, he ended up getting sick. And so I remember going around trying to, you know, throw my resume around to all these sponsors. And and I remember a guy telling me, hey, man, you're, you're too old. Why would I pick you up? You know, Quicksilver was one that, that understood Mavericks at the time, I think. And it just was the, the perfect timing. So for me, you know, to get to your question, is that the Quicksilver picked me up and and they were doing a lot of things. They're running events. Um, they were producing, they, they had the Eddie, the Quicksilver Eddie Icao event. And they ended up just slightly after that in the 2000s, they developed the Men Who Ride Mountains Mavericks event. So it was a perfect kind of pickup for, 
for me and, and for them at the time because I helped develop that event with Jeff Clark. So it was just a good timing. And, it, and for me, I guess the answer to the question is, is that anytime you have a door open, you should experiment and try it out, right? Where, so with Quicksilver, I had been doing some local events, um, broadcasting local events, you know, these, these little pro events, and I'd still participate in them and then also talk about it. Jay Johnson was a, a guy who was doing production of, you know, webcasts at the time. And um, he was doing the smaller events then, you know, all the CT events were getting done by the bigger brands. And so I just started doing, you know, doors open, like, hey, I can make a couple hundred bucks here doing this thing and, and also compete in the event and talk about it. And I had a ball doing it. So that was one thing that I, uh, that door that I, was there. Um, you know, obviously the other door that was wide open was the fact that I had this surfing family that had a, a factory. So I was shaping surfboards um, and I was just doing it all, you know, anything that I could surf wise and, you know, developing and sales too. I was in the shop working, you know, to help subsidize my career. Um, I could leave at any time because it's his dad's business, right? So it was a perfect uh, recipe to be able to kind of do it all, um, whether it's manufacturing of surfboards, selling of surfboards, doing broadcast and all of these things I could do together. And, and it just worked and meshed it. And then all of a sudden, here I am, right? It's um, 15 years later and the broadcast stuff just kind of fell on my lap. I'm very fortunate that that happened that way. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point about saying yes to open doors in terms of learning experiences because you end up becoming a renaissance man in a lot of different ways. And what you may learn on the sales floor is something you're going to take into a marketing meeting, that insight. And then what you learn in the corporate world is might be something you apply to management of the surf shop or in the broadcast world to really anything. Like I, I've always found that like if you can get people to stand you long enough to mm -hmm. impart some insight or wisdom, you can go, great, I can kind of maybe take that and tweak it and put it over here in my life and, and try to make it work. And you become like a utility player in a lot of ways. Well, and that's, a, again, that's why... You know, at the at the end of my career, all of a sudden, I've got this you know marketing job that I took at, at Quicksilver. It's like you know, here's this opportunity. They're like, hey, we're we're doing something with this you know brand that's called the Waterman Collection. Do you want to be a part of it? And I'm like, sure. I raised my hand. To, you know, I'll move to Southern California. And all of a sudden, I've got this you know great job at a corporate company that has supported me for so many years, and I'm developing something that I really love. And I was able to learn there, like you said, a, a corporate you know, job. And and at that point. Your son, John, is he's either already been identified or he's in the process of being identified as a huge prospect for Quicksilver coming up. So moving to, I think you live in San Clemente. Uh, well, I, I, <laughs> I, I got to San Clemente because I wanted to be <laughs> kind of in the next best surfing community in Southern California. You know, Santa Barbara is a little too far away. So San Clemente was at least within an hour to drive there. I did that for a, a small amount of time, but I was commuting. So I was commuting for an hour in the morning and an hour back and my surf time was limited. So I ended up moving up to, to Newport being a lot closer. But yeah, John, you know, we, we did actually, Dana Point is actually where I ended up living mm. and then moved up to, to Newport Beach. And, and John at that time was, you know, he was having great success in the amateur organizations and it was a perfect move for us to put him kind of in, you know, the Orange County spotlight. I'm curious, um, you know, at that time, you've got a very talented um, progeny in John doing, you know, competitive surfing. You've been exposed to sort of, I guess, a growing platform at the championship tour level through Quicksilver, um, through being a broadcaster and through interacting with that team and seeing what that kind of a career pathway looks like. I'm curious if there are any, not second thoughts, but just hesitation on, I'm going to push my son into Mavericks at some point. Or was that always something like, hey, if he surfs, he's going out there? Um, it's interesting. That's a, a funny one. I think I can even go back to my very first experiences of me surfing with my father. My biggest um, fear was to scare him away from it. <laughs> so I always made sure that when we were doing, when we were surfing together, that I, I put him in situations that he was going to enjoy it and, and not scare him away from it. So mm -hmm. I was always doing that. And that's similar to what I would say in regards to Mavericks, I never pushed him to do it. It was always something where, um, do you want to, do you want, you know, do you want to attempt it, uh, you know, and to now he's literally doing it on his own. Right. So, I mean, just yesterday Mavericks broke after the, you know, the Piahi swell, he went there and surfed yesterday and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, okay, you know, I'm trying to give him an opportunity like, oh, he can take the ski out. You can um, grab some of your buddies. And he's like, you know what, dad, I, I kind of want to just paddle out. I haven't done, you know, that enough. I want to do it and I know how to do it, but I've never done it. So, you know, in his own mind, he's kind of been able to do it on his own. 
right? I gave him the tools. Mm -hmm. um, I gave him uh, the communication on how to do stuff. But ultimately, I never said, you're going to Mavericks. You know, like this is something that you've got to be able to want on your own. And I think that's for anybody who's going to go out and surf big waves. You got to do it on your own. As, as one of the undeniably Peter Mel is on the Mount Rushmore of Maverick surfers, you maybe more than anyone understand how amazing it is to experience it, um, but also how dangerous it is. Mm -hmm. Does that ever stress you out as a parent? Interesting enough, no. And, and, and I don't, I mean, I can't say no completely because that's, that's just being. There's always like a, a, a minimum floor of stress. As a yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, literally having him you know, move to Southern California or even drive to Southern California could be stressful. Sure. <laughs> um, but I, I do believe I know my son well enough to know that he is, um, that his approach is not reckless. So, and I've also given him the best tools I could possibly have given him, you know, from nowadays too. I mean, I, I surfed Mavics for 15 years with, with no flotation, um, you know, and, and nowadays we have these incredible safety devices with these inflation vests that, that are saving lives. You know, anybody who has ever worn an inflation vest, there's never been anyone who's passed away in big ways wearing this flotation vest. So that gives me a bit of comfort, um, but also I think is more more of the comfort I have is the way that I know my son in the approach he's going to take. He's not going to be reckless. It, it is insane to think of not comparing surfing experiences at all, but just how radical technology has sort of exponentially increased even in like a short amount of time, as you said, with the flotation device and, and what they mean to um, providing a safety net for everyone out there. I mean, when you guys were going out there, when you started, it was there was probably barely any boats and oh no you know. there was there was there was only you know and a boat that was going to go you know and and I'll tell the story of of Mark Fu's passing and that was there was boats in the water at the time there and and even them you know being a boat in the water not even realizing that that Fu had not appeared you know yeah. there was this presumption that you know he's a the, one of the best big wave riders in the world oh he's just probably you know we saw that we, his board was broken but we never accounted for him you know he just thought oh yeah he's grabbing another board he's going to be right back out you know, and then you find them an hour and a half later. So, and that boat did find them that was out in the water. And it's not to their fault. It's just that it's not expected, I guess. I mean, and, it's, it, and it's overlooked. And in a lot of ways, you guys were really pushing the frontier of human experience in a lot of ways. I mean, the ocean is the most alien frontier to the human species on the planet. Still. Yeah. To, to this day, right? And you guys are out there doing something that had never been done. So all the protocols and mechanisms that you uh, unfortunately a lot of times you have to develop learn through tragic <laughs> yeah. experience yeah you have to develop yeah and, and that's why i think that i mean there's some some great things out there now i mean not only inflation plus but say brag which is the you know the big wave risk assessment group which is basically a peers uh, you know all of my peers that are developing all of those experiences and and now being able to make it safer now of course the downside to that or you know is that all of a sudden we have a much more crowded which then a lineup which then increases some of the dangers there and again i think that we will probably end up through experiences develop ways to to curb that haven't yet but <laughs> we'll see you're 50 years old now yep and you have four decades of diverse extreme really unprecedented in a lot of ways surfing experience you know at age 50 what is that appetite for pushing yourself look like compared to when you got your first big waves at sunset beach it, it's still there but i know that there's limitations to it right i just don't have the time to be solely focusing because i am a father i am a husband i am a broadcaster i am a surf shop owner my time is you know i can't just focus solely on one thing so i know that um, I do have the desire to ride big waves, but an example being is that sitting at Piahi, you know, yesterday or two days ago, broadcasting that event, like what was my desire looking out there at that wave in the morning, wanting to be out there and experiencing it? I was actually way more excited to be calling it. <laughs> and that's, that's 50, that's experience. You know, it's, it's been an honor. Just recently, we, we were able to go to the Eddie Aikau ceremony, which is again, for me, the Eddie uh, is an event that is very, very dear to my heart, not only because it was one of the first big wave surfing competitions, but because of who the, the man that it honors. So that uh, being a quote unquote legend in a legend heat, like that's excites me. Um, that was kind of fun to be recognized for that. And I, and I do know that if the competition were to go, I, I'm going to, going to be there um, because the, as you mentioned about the contest and being the desire to do it, I still have that desire to compete and I still have that desire. But I think if I'm, 
out there and it's and it's wild and, <laughs> and there's a wave that's going to be a closeout. I don't know if I'll be turning around and trying to go on it. <laughs> we'll see. Well, this one, this this conversation is dropping early January 2020. So if you're sitting at home in Santa Cruz <laughs> and you get a buoy readout that looks appealing, are you driving up to Pillar Point? The next yes, day? I am. And, and the reason why I'm doing that is that I most likely will be doing it with my son and knowing because he wants to do it. And I will get to be there for him because I do believe that I do, have, you know, as much as I knew he was out there yesterday and I'm on the surf line cam watching to see if I could see him catching some waves and, and saying, hey, tell me when you paddle out and tell me when you return, you know, because I'm, I'm a father. I'm not completely like, you know, negligent in that sense that I <laughs> don't worry about him. But I, I, being able to share those experiences with him is something that I really get a lot of excitement and joy out of um, because I know how much it meant to me at the time to, to ride a, a big wave and kick out in the channel. And I, you know, when he rode, he rode a really big wave yesterday and, you know, it was one of the biggest waves that he's ever ridden and getting that phone call like, dude, I got a big one. And I'm like, really? I want to see it. I want to see it. You know, and he ends up going to the surf line cam and, and finding the wave and sending it to me. And I got to kind of experience it through him. And so I think that yeah, going up there and, and the buoy range is going to be good. I'm, I'm going up there for a couple roles. One is maybe I feel good and I'm going to go and I'm going to catch some waves because I've gotten a new desire because John has been out there and I also love it. So, I mean, I've ridden some big waves recently that, um, and I still feel like I can do it. So I have been, but again, I'm not pushing it like I used to. I mean, this conversation started by us um, kind of analyzing what maybe people's impression of you is from the broadcast um, and you kind of highlighting like, yeah, it's a role that I'm trying to play. I'm trying to deliver for a, a set of people. But really this conversation to me feels like it's it's been about you discussing the balance that you've found in your life in a lot of ways and the, the maturity. And, and as I said, like the Aloha Mr. Rogers is actually like this badass hell's angel and has had this incredible life. But you've seemed like you found a way to synthesize a lot of those things at this point in your life. I, I have. And I'm, but I'm, again, like as I've gotten older, I've also um, realized that I still got a ton to learn and, and I want to learn more, right? Is it whether it's how to get myself psychologically through turning 50, <laughs> you know, um, and this not pod, this podcast is probably helping. <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you for the therapy. Um, <laughs> and I think you'll run into that a lot as you get further into this, but yeah, you know, w what's driving me these days more than anything. First of all, I love where surfing is. I love the platform in which that we are able to experience and me being a part of it, you know, the development of the big wave tour was a, another role that I had as a commissioner of the big wave tour, which I balanced with broadcast. But that was something that I really liked doing, even though it was the most stressful thing I'd ever done. That's where I, you know, the balance being is that I still, I, I have a PhD in surfing, right? So being able to share all of that with everyone is something that I find joy in. Um, so that balance, but also, you know, being a good husband and, and not just solely doing myself, you know, really only worrying about myself and my job and, and John's job, whereas I need to be you know, a good husband too. And that's always, I'm learning that. So psychologically, and, and thank you for the therapy, <laughs> I get to reflect on that. <laughs> well, and I, and, and I think the through line across all that is like, it, it's a double-edged sword in terms of complacency with surfing, but surfing people like to say, like, it's something you can never master. And this is true. So I do think that on the one hand, it makes you restless, but on the other hand, it keeps you open to being like, I, I, I tomorrow's, I, I might get the best wave of my life tomorrow. Absolutely. Or I might learn something new, or I can, I can be, you know, a better person. What about Kelly Slater's 10? Like, did we think that was going to happen at 47 years old during that heat? Probably little glimpse of it. He did. He did, huh? He did. Oh man, that's, uh, that's, that's amazing still. I, I, you know, and that's funny how, you know, I've been able to watch him his whole career and I still have the desire to watch him and, and I'm not the only one because as soon as Kelly's in the water, there is a crowd like no other. I, I, it's, it's, and it's interesting being in our roles because whatever it is, if you're marketing or your brand or your communications or your broadcast, there's always a conversation around parallels and saying, okay, like how do we use an example from another sport or entertainment or some other figure to take best practices and elevate this person. But the reality is, is there's never been anyone like this person. There's no model. He, he's been the next best thing in surfing for three decades. And he, like he is setting the mold in a lot of ways. Yeah, no, it's a, I mean, I'm sure in a, in a way it's helped a lot of other surfers around him to keep their and give their career longevity. <laughs> you know? I mean, I think you have too. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, and and but I, I I don't think it's necessarily what he he's been you know focusing a lot on on the I think equipment's a drive for him, but I think competition is really you know it's amazing what he's been able to do competitively. Sure. So there and there isn't you know I I think I've got a little broader spectrum right like I've I've opened a lot of doors right and I've experienced a lot opening those doors and that's something that I think that if I can instill that out to the public and to the rest of the world is is yeah you know what if there's a an opportunity check it out um, you never know what's going to happen awesome so before we go we're going to do the lightning round so these are 10 questions Ooh, answer as fast as you can <laughs> wait yeah. i'm supposed i'm learning that i'm supposed to listen and not react too quickly that's been one of my um modes i've been trying to figure out <laughs> Because I do get quite reactive. Would, uh, react, react. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, if you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad, bonzer, or finless, which would you take? It would be thruster, 100%. Works in everything. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Burrito. Lots of it. <laughs> Burrito or pizza? <laughs> Burrito. Last book you read? Uh, I am reading, shoot, it's the, um, dang it. I'm trying to think of the, the cause. I'm still reading it. It is the story of the boy who, I don't even know the damn title of it. That's funny. Give us a, give us a cliff notes. It is the story of the boy who is learning. He's crossing the Sahara Desert. Yeah, I know you've read the book. You had to have. It's a, a book that was written by a Portuguese author that it was translated into English. It's the Alchemist? The Alchemist. Thank oh, you. Man, I'm so lucky I got that right. <laughs> I'm glad you did too. <laughs> we could have just been. <laughs> so I'm reading really, The Alchemist. We could have really stalled out during the lightning round. <laughs> So the alchemist, I'm reading about halfway through. He's in the middle of the desert. Okay. <laughs> well, well, no comment on what happens. Okay. <laughs> um, best surf film ever. Wow. Um, you you uh, can say the kill three. No, no, no. I'm actually going to say um, Dana Brown's film um, that I was able to participate in with the strapped crew. One wave you never have to go back to. Hmm. I don't think there is one. Only get to surf one wave for the rest of your life. Mavericks? That was like a question mark at the end, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the way I said that. <laughs> Best person to share a lineup with? My son. Worst person to share a lineup with? No one. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by? Ooh, man. I have the reactionary to it. I, uh, being completely honest at all times. Great answer. Peter Mel, thank you for going on the lineup. Thank you, David. So that's it. That's our conversation with Peter Mel. I hope you enjoyed it. I really can't overstate the privilege it is for me to be able to have conversations with people that I legitimately consider to be heroes and just beyond impressive. It's really special and I appreciate you listening to these. It means I get to keep doing it. If you do like them, please download, listen, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you next week.